Everything around us has an epic story to tell, no matter how small or large. Take the bicycle. Early models were dangerous contraptions. Nothing like the ones we ride today. Or chewing gum. The modern type was invented accidentally 140 years ago. But we know now that gum has stuck around a lot longer than that. Even traffic lights. The first was installed in London in 1868. We're going to look at 16 everyday things, revealing how they came to be. How we wouldn't be drinking coffee if it weren't for a series of daring thefts. Why the first person to look into a mirror saw more than a reflection. And how an invention as simple as string can change the world forever. These stories and others are all part of the epic history of everyday things. The world around us holds countless stories. Take a closer look behind the million things that make up a day and you'll find epic tales of adventure, ingenuity, and hardship. Most of us are totally unconscious of these stories. Lamps, paintings, pillows, windows, even doorknobs, all have epic histories. Consider two surprising things about the alarm clock. In 1787, the creator of the first American alarm clock didn't consider that anyone might want to wake up later than he did. Later, during World War II, America set aside manufacturing resources for the war effort. Alarm clock production stopped, then quickly resumed when people couldn't show up for work on time. An average guy like Joe has no idea about any of this, and he's unlikely to find out. Because today, Joe will die. It will be a day full of near misses and one final direct hit. Every morning in the bathroom, we link arms with some very ancient innovators. Ancient Egypt, Rome, and Greece all made epic contributions to fresh breath. In 3000 BC, Egyptians created the first toothpaste, mixing the most abrasive ingredients they could find. It is unlikely that it tasted very good. For toothbrushes, the Egyptians used twigs. Other cultures used feathers, horsetail hairs, and porcupine quills. Everywhere we turn are modern examples of crucial discoveries that once changed the course of human progress. We're about to take a closer look at string, one of the most important inventions of them all. To explain the epic history of string, we leave Joe now. It's one of those things that graphically represents a very big difference between us and other creatures. It represents a very significant turning point in the development of what makes you and I human. Professor Adavazio says the invention of string is what set man apart. Other animals can use tools, but only man can create what the professor calls additive technology. If you assume that making items out of multiple pieces is a highly significant event in the development of us, then string is one of the very first examples of that kind of technology we know of, if not the first example. String is made from tree bark through a three-step process. First, peel the bark from a branch. Next, roll the bark fibers together to make cordage. Finally, fold the cordage in half and twist each line together. Repeat this step enough times and eventually you have string. 
once you've got string and the concept of putting things together to manufacture other things, there's a whole world available to you of other kinds of additive technologies, even if they don't involve string. It's a sign of the way you think. With string, our weapons improved, making us better hunters of both beast and other men. Five thousand years later, Joe was unlikely to die being ambushed. Nonetheless, he will die today. Maybe even on his morning run with his dog. Dogs have been man's best friend for 15,000 years. They have kept us warm and defended us from attackers. Nowadays, they tend to be less useful. Very few people run barefoot these days, but for most of history, we did everything with naked feet. Several thousand years after man-made string, another invention would drastically alter civilization. Shoes. Until recently, early clothing and shoes were a mystery to us. Very few examples had been found. But for this man's sudden death, we would have remained ignorant. Mere hours after his death, 5,000 years ago, his body was frozen solid. No one came to look for him. In a freak combination of location, timing, and weather, his body and all his possessions were hermetically sealed beneath glacial ice for more than 5,000 years, until the ice finally melted. When discovered in 1991 in the Otzel Alps on the border of what is now Austria and Italy, the authorities thought he was a modern corpse. But when the truth was revealed, news of the Iceman named Otzi electrified the scientific community. By studying his bones, forensic scientists determined the Iceman was 45 years old at the time of his death, far older than people of the late Stone Age were expected to survive. Otzi's possessions held further surprises, such as his ax, made of copper, 1,000 years before they were thought to be copper tools. But the biggest revelation of all were his shoes. The shoes were comfortable, they were warm, wrapping the feet in bear skin, in deer skin, in a macrame sock was a very good response to the environment of the Alps. Using the decayed remains as a guide, experts recreated Otzi shoes and gave them to a modern mountaineer for field testing. After days of trekking through the Otzel Mountains, the verdict was clear. In the mountaineer's own words, there is no mountain in Europe that can't be conquered in these shoes. In Otzi's time, his incredible shoes would have been a valued possession. 5,000 years later, we tend to take our shoes very much for granted until we are forced to go without them. Joe knows that running shoeless on our modern streets is a generally unpleasant experience, but until now, he didn't realize that it could be far worse than that. It can be deadly. The world is full of epic stories, but most of us are too distracted to stop and think about them. Sometimes it can get us into trouble. Take Joe, for instance. Today is his last day alive. But Joe will not die on this road. And when he does die, it won't be his dog's fault. If anything, dogs have often helped man live longer. In ancient Greece, dogs were trained to lick sick patients 
In the 14th century, St. Rock was said to have been healed of a plague of sores by a dog's tongue. Joe is still annoyed with his dog, so he is most certainly not thinking about how many of the everyday items in our kitchens have their own strange tales to tell, including food. There is evidence of cheese from over 4,000 years ago, while other clues suggest cheese might be twice as old as that. Nobody knows exactly where cheese was first made, but we have a fair idea how it was discovered. Cheese is believed to have been created by accident. When milk, being carried on horseback, was churned into a solid by the horse's movements. This early cheese wouldn't have looked very nice, but over thousands of years, it would come to be loved by both man and beast. The cheese in Joe's omelet is a rare example of food spoilage resulting in something delicious. Today, Joe knows almost nothing about the origins of his breakfast or the table manners of his ancestors. For the majority of human history, food preservation ranked as one of the most difficult and deadly problems until the arrival of the can, allowing a few small countries to take the world by storm. Today, cans are such common household items, we often forget their importance. But there was a time not long ago when the whole world bowed before the might of the humble can. Armies march on their stomachs, and commanders for centuries have always had a really tough time keeping their troops fed as they've marched into distant locations and foreign lands. There were major problems for any army that was trying to engage in a, in a battle or a conquest over a period of time. Food would spoil, sometimes the armies would run out of food, food would be scarce. It was a real issue, and for many armies, access to a good food supply was more important than having superior weaponry or even great valor. Napoleon was so obsessed with the idea of food preservation for his troops that in 1795, he offered a 12,000 franc reward, about $40,000 in today's money, to anyone who could come up with a solution. In 1810, the prize was won by a French chef named Nicolas Appert. Appert's innovation was to put food inside sealed bottles. The heat destroyed the microorganisms that cause food to spoil and also formed a vacuum seal to keep any new microorganisms out. Appert introduced his invention to the world through a dramatic publicity stunt that involved preserving an entire sheep. The European invention of canning allowed one continent to expand its power from a few small colonies to control of most of the globe. Well, the 19th century was really the era of classical imperialism, when European powers were trying to bring the whole world under their dominion. Europeans took canned foods with them into some of the most inhospitable environments in the world. They went to the North Pole. They climbed mountains and crossed deserts, all accompanied by Underwood's deviled ham. Well, the Arctic explorers wanted to have a little bit of sunshine on those, you know, cold Arctic days. And so having spring peas or green beans was really, you know, vital to morale. Still, major problems with the can remain. One of the biggest was lead contamination which contributed to the deaths of all 129 Arctic explorers in the Franklin Expedition of 1845. Besides the lead, the cans performed exceedingly well. 100 years later, one of the sealed cans was discovered and opened. The food had not yet spoiled. Not using lead as a sealant solved one of the can's biggest problems. But before the can could become the big hit it is today, one more obstacle had to be overcome. How to open it. 
early cans were made of iron and weighed more than the food they contained. Suggested methods of opening were laborious and required the use of heavy tools. It was recommended to use a hammer and chisel, but soldiers, who used cans the most, rarely had those handy. Some tried to hack the cans open with bayonets. Others smashed them open with rocks. A brave few were especially creative. Proving that sometimes necessity is the mother not of invention, but of stupidity. Beginning in World War II, the U.S. military solved this problem by issuing their own can opener to soldiers, the P-38. Hey, Charlie, I'll trade this, this stuff for your candy and cigarettes. Toss in your coffee and it's a deal. Easy-to-use household can openers did not come into existence until nearly a century after the can first appeared. Less than 50 years after that, astronauts were using these can openers in space. Back on Earth, Joe has never given a moment's thought to how convenient his can opener is. The same can be said of many items in his kitchen, such as his dishwasher. The first dishwasher was built in 1886 in Illinois by Josephine Cochran, a wealthy socialite who was annoyed that her servants kept chipping her china while washing. But there is one thing in the kitchen that modern man relies on above all others. Many claim they can't live without it. Yet they have no idea of the 1,500 years of treachery bold gambles, terrible hardships, and even the seduction it took for coffee to be with us today. Our story begins on the plains of Africa with a most unusual cast of characters. Kali frequented long journeys across the highlands of the country. And on one of his journeys, as he was tired, he notices that the goats were acting very energetic and jumping around frantically. As he's trying to figure out why they're behaving this way, he discovers that they're chewing onto these berries from a shrub. So he goes ahead and tries the cherries himself, and then he finds out that he has all this energy and acting very frantic as well. Kali then takes the berries to a learned holy man and tells him about the effects. The holy man disapproves it and throws the berries into the fire. But as the berries were roasting, it created this aroma that the holy man himself found to be very appealing. He then ground it up and dissolves it in water, and that became the first cup of coffee. Today, coffee is the second most traded product in the world. But until 300 years ago, the only way to get it was to steal it. It wasn't until about 500 AD that coffee beans came to be roasted in Yemen and in Egypt, and the beverage as it is known today was first sipped. By the 16th century, the first coffee houses were opening in the Muslim world. But the Arabs, who believed the brew to have mystical powers, zealously guarded their treasure and refused to export fertile beans to the West. For almost 500 years, the Arabs enjoyed coffee, but no one did anywhere else. In the 17th century, Baba Budan, an Indian holy man, was on a pilgrimage to Mecca. He grew a liking to coffee, much like the other holy men in the area, as it enhanced their religious experience. One dark Arabian night, Baba Budan took six fertile beans and hid it in the folds of his dhoti and smuggled it out of Mecca. Baba Budan's journey ended in a deadly ambush, but the beans he smuggled made it to India, where they were planted and bore fruit. Today, Baba Budan is revered as both an Indian saint and a man who liberated coffee. Later that century, coffee arrived in Europe and became an instant success. The Dutch would come to monopolize the trade, growing the plants in their colonies. But they soon made a mistake. They gifted a plant to King Louis XIV of France. Infertile beans were common in Europe, but a live plant was exceedingly rare and precious. Coffee was of paramount importance in the, in the international trade at that time. And, and for Louis XIV, it was really his prized possession. And that's really demonstrated in the, in the intricacy of 
the greenhouse built to house his beautiful coffee plant. While King Louis had no interest in sharing his prized possession, another man had his own plans for the future of coffee in Europe. First, he would have to get his hands on Louis's coffee plant. There was a, a French naval officer named uh, Gabriel Mathieu de Clou, who was uh, a, an ambitious soldier, to say the least, decided that he wanted to have a hand in competing with the Dutch global trade. If he could get uh, one fraction, just a tiny little clip off of that plant and bring it to m the French colony of Martinique, then uh, he would have his meal ticket. De Clou petitions the king for a clipping from the royal plant, and D Louis XIV obviously, you know, refuses. De Clou scales the wall, leads a moonlight raid, goes into the, goes into the hothouse, takes a tiny little clipping and escapes unseen. This would only be the first in a series of life-threatening trials for De Clou as he set sail from France, headed for the Caribbean. But to De Clou, his life was of secondary importance to the health of his treasured plant. As he recounted in his journal, a fellow passenger, jealous of De Clou's plant, attempted to purchase it from him. After De Clou refused, the villain nearly tore the plant in half, trying to wrestle it from De Clou's grasp. Later on his voyage, a Tunisian pirate ship attacked and attempted to capture his vessel and his precious cargo. After a fierce showdown with the pirates, De Clou's ship narrowly escaped, and De Clou, and more importantly, the plant, were safe. Next, the ship encountered a violent storm, rocking the boat wildly in its wake and threatening to send the ship, De Clou, and his plant to the bottom of the ocean. The storm passed, and once again, De Clou and his plant survived. The ship was left afloat, peaceful under a blazing sun. This calm, which seemed a relief at first, proved more sinister than any previous threat. Soon, water supplies grew short. Dying of thirst is one of the worst fates that can befall a man. Yet the clue was willing to risk it, giving his ration to the coffee plant. Growing weak from thirst and exhaustion, De Clou didn't know it at the time, but he and his plant would only need to endure a few more days. His desperate gamble paid off. The ship made it at last to Martinique, where, under constant guard, the plant grew fruitful and multiplied. Over the next 50 years, De Clou's coffee bush yielded a family of about 18 million other plants. Most people today know nothing of these dangerous gambles. They just think of coffee as a pleasant way to start the morning. As we go through our day, we are surrounded by simple things that have arrived in our lives through the most dramatic of circumstances. Take your morning cup of coffee, for example. A guy like Joe might know that the beans came from Brazil but has no idea what it took to get them there in the first place. The Brazilian government wanted a piece of the coffee trade, but they had no plants. So in 1727, they sent Lieutenant Colonel Francisco de Mayo Palheta to retrieve some from nearby French Guiana. Lieutenant Colonel Palheta was, was swiftly dispatched to French Guiana, and his official mission was to settle a border dispute but his real task was to come up with a coffee plant. But in the 18th century, coffee plants were jealously guarded. Plantations were literally fortified. The governor really knew that what he had was valuable and that other people were gonna try to steal it. So Palheta decided that he would kind of focus his attack on, a, on, a, on an easier target, and that happened to be the governor's wife, Marie Claude. Palheta was known for his legendary charm and the spell he tended to cast over the fairer sex. Which he was more than willing to employ if it meant helping his country. Being a gentleman, 
Powhatta did not speak of what passed behind closed doors. But we do know that before his return to Brazil, Marie Claude presented him with a token of her affection. Her real gift was hidden inside. This seedling would grow and multiply, eventually establishing Brazil as the world's greatest coffee empire. And by 1800, that once elusive plant would become a staple of South American agriculture. Distractions are a part of modern life, a potentially deadly part, as Joe will discover. It's common knowledge not to walk under ladders. History gives many reasons why. For example, in medieval times, ladders were used to cut hanged bodies down from the gallows. To walk under this ladder put one at risk of being hit by a falling corpse, a fate no one desires. You want to walk across the street, okay? Joe's day will be full of close shaves with death. And then, finally, his luck will run out. Perhaps while he gets a haircut, a ritual that began thousands of years ago, though for reasons quite different than those of today. Dating back to Egyptian times, it was believed that evil spirits would enter the body through the hair. There were barbers back then as well. So for the, the, the commoner that wasn't in the priesthood or in any sort of upper echelons of society, they would be able to go to a barber shop. If you go back to the Middle Ages, um, they were surgeon barbers. So they'd perform leeching, lancing of boils, and in doing so, they would have swabs of cloth that would collect the blood, and also dry swabs as well. And what happened at the end of the operation and the procedures they were doing, they would rinse and hang out these swabs to dry. Some of them were dry and obviously white swabs, and the others were stained with blood. And it's from that that we today have the red and white barber pole. Another interpretation is that the red symbolizes blood, the white, shaving cream, and the blue, ink, as barbers also used to give tattoos. Today, barbers tend to focus only on cutting hair, which suits Joe just fine. Choosing a hairstyle is easier when you see yourself from all angles. But this is a recent development for mankind. For most of history, there was no such thing as a mirror. For us as 21st century people, it's very difficult to imagine what it must have been like to live in antiquity well up through the Middle Ages, hardly ever seeing your reflection. We look at ourselves in mirrors literally hundreds of times a day. A person living in antiquity, a person living in prehistoric times, literally wouldn't have that many opportunities in his or her lifetime to catch a glimpse of themselves. The experience must have been startling. It must have been extraordinary. People laugh and burst into giggle fits when they hear their voice for the very first time on a tape recorder. We don't actually know what we sound like. Imagine not knowing what you look like. Seeing one's own reflection was such a strange concept to most people that they figured it must be the work of otherworldly forces. The idea of looking at a reflection of yourself was a almost magical experience. It was such a rarity and it was such a jarring, shocking experience that an individual really felt like he was gazing into a portal from another world. We have records of people using reflective objects to see into other worlds, to see into the future, um, to expand their vision almost to that of an angel or even a god. It was that extraordinary an experience for people. As recently as 400 years ago, great men of science were using mirrors for supernatural guidance. One such man was an English mathematician, astronomer, navigator, and alchemist named John Dee. After decades of conventional studies, Dee's thirst for evermore secrets brought him to the occult. In 1552, Dee met a medium named Edward Kelly 
who believed he could communicate with spirits using an Aztec mirror made of volcanic glass. Although more accurate mirrors existed, Dee and Kelly felt the spiritual presence was stronger in the ancient obsidian. Kelly would fall into a trance, gazing into the mirror. Then the angels would begin communicating with him. Dee would write down the prophecies Kelly received from the mirror. Dee would go on to publish these prophecies as numerous tomes, including the five books of mystery. Contained in these books were startling predictions, including the execution of Mary, Queen of Scots, and the invasion of the Spanish Armada, both of which occurred within five years of the predictions being made. There were lots of other predictions that were altogether wrong, as is often the case in these things. Dee and Kelly believed so deeply in the communiques they were receiving through their magic mirrors that one day, Kelly approached Dee and said that one of the spiritual beings they had contacted in their sessions was actually instructing them to swap wives, to arrange a kind of free love arrangement in their household. And Dee, a scientist and an older man than Kelly, believed so deeply uh, in these magical communiques in their, in their sessions with mirrors that he complied. The men were willing to rearrange the most intimate details of their lives because their conviction was so great in the authenticity of the communication they were receiving through their magic mirrors. But the fact is, uh, Dee, as a scientist, believed he was pursuing a kind of natural science by contacting these angels and spirits through mirrors and crystal balls. Uh, with Edward Kelly. He didn't feel it was something um, dark or demonic or satanic or even otherworldly. He felt it was the fulfillment of natural philosophy. These panes of volcanic glass or polished metal were the only mirrors available to man for most of history. Mirrors as we know them today did not come into being until the 13th century in Venice. And when they did, the technology would become one of the world's best kept secrets. When clear glass was invented in such a way that it could be uh, mass produced on some scale, it was an object of extraordinary value. And the artisans and the investors who held the secrets as to how to make clear glass guarded them the way that we would guard the secrets to weapons of war today. The process of early glassmaking was very perilous. It involved using enormously hot furnaces uh, that were under tremendous pressure and there was a risk of an explosion and fire. That's how the island of Murano became a center of glassmaking. It was first a decision based on safety. There was a need to move these furnaces away from population centers. And there was an ancillary benefit, which is that it isolated some of the artisans and uh, so it was thought prevented them from sharing their secrets with foreign powers. Because the glass blowers of Murano were the only ones to know the secret of making glass mirrors, the rulers of Venice confined them to their island and threatened them with death if they tried to escape. Emissaries from France, Spain, Germany, and the Netherlands would make their way to Murano to order glass and mirrors. They would offer the talented glass blowers of Murano large sums of money to come practice their skills in foreign lands. If money wasn't enough, a cunning emissary would come prepared with other tempting offers. Murano's glassmakers must have found these offers difficult to resist. Even though they were treated with great respect on the island, some felt they were nothing more than prisoners in a gilded cage. So it is no wonder a few of these master craftsmen could be persuaded to pack their bags and take their skills to foreign lands. But leaving wasn't so simple. The ruling Venetian council hired assassins whose sole mission was to make sure Murano's secrets never left the island. If any of these artisans left that island and were seen to defect to a foreign power, their families would be imprisoned, uh, troops would be sent to kidnap them to bring them back to Murano, and they could be punished by death. In 1612, an Italian glassmaker named Antonio Neri 
published a book with all of Murano's secrets. Mirrors soon became common objects, easily obtained everywhere. So it is that today we are able to enjoy a vision of the back of our head, a vision that would have amazed people throughout history. There are epic stories behind even the simplest things. Most of us, however, never give these things or their stories a moment's thought. Take the act of shaving, for example. Before the mass production of the safety razor in 1904, to get a shave from a barber was to put your life in his hands. For a guy like Joe, a straight razor shave is a really bad idea, since he is destined to die today. The story of shaving goes back well before the invention of blades, to around 5,000 years ago. Archaeology shows us and tells us that as far back as 20,000 years ago, primitive cave-dwelling man was pulling facial hair out with clamshells, shaving with shards of flint or volcanic glass, and where geographically possible, even shark tooth. Blades made of volcanic glass, or obsidian, were some of the most widely used. While ancient man lacked such modern shaving tools as mirrors and shaving cream, his razors were sharper than the ones we use today. If chipped right, obsidian can have an edge as fine as one molecule, 500 times sharper than a steel blade. The result would have been a nice, clean shave. By the 18th century, straight razors made with steel blades became the standard shaving tool until they were largely replaced about a hundred years ago, when American businessman King Gillette invented disposable blades for safety razors in 1904. Most barbers don't get too much practice anymore using the straight razor, also known as a cutthroat razor. In 1841, Henry David Thoreau's brother, John, died from an infected shaving cut. Henry is said to have moved to Walden Pond to work through his grief. As Joe will soon learn, death can come in even more unexpected ways than these. But Joe is not too worried about death right now. He's just realized there's something he forgot to do. Something very basic. A call that all men everywhere must heed. Ancient Romans used urine for cleaning grease stains and tanning leather. Urine was such a large industry that around 60 AD, the Emperor Nero placed a tax on it. For most of man's history, when he felt the urge to go, he just went, wherever he happened to be, which explains why most early cities were disease-ridden and foul-smelling, a fact that millions of people learned to live with until one invention changed all that. One invention that, coupled with a few others, formed a system for disposing of human waste in a manner far more sanitary than ever before. It made our homes and our cities safer and healthier. It's far too easy to underestimate the glory of the flush toilet, the throne of civilization. If we think about it all, it's like, oh, what a great thing to have. But in truth, like, I think like plumbing, toilets were like the saviors of civilization. If it weren't for the, the toilet, the modern flush toilet invented plumbing, the world wouldn't, wouldn't have advanced. 
the most successful early empires understood that to be a great civilization, you must have a great sewage system. The Romans had a, a goddess, Cloacina, who, who, who oversaw everything having to do with the sewage and, uh, and the water leaving the town. They worshipped her and relied on, on her to, to make sure that the waste and the diseases left the city. That's how important it was to them. And when they went to another part of the world and they, and they were setting up um, they're trying to conquer it. The first thing they built were the baths. We would call them baths, but really the, the key component to it wasn't just these places to soak in the water. It was, it was actually the, the toilets. Sometimes they'd have a dozen, maybe 20 seats all lined up in the same room. Water would flow under the seat, and all the men, the leaders of the town, the politicians, the, you know, the soldiers, would go in there and talk for hours on end, you know, get, get the business done, you know, every way conceivable, <laughs> and, then, uh, and then leave, and the, and the waste would, would go down into their massive aqueducts. I mean, these aqueducts are still standing today. After the fall of the Roman Empire, toilets and sewers, like many other advances, vanished from West. As more and more people moved into cities, and more and more waste piled up, you couldn't just throw it out in the streets, so they built cesspits, huge deep pits that would take maybe years to fill up. Eventually they did, <laughs> it overflow, and then the night saw them in, the men who would come in and take the waste out of the streets also had the job of emptying those pits. It was an unbearable job. They got paid triple the, the normal wages, but it really wasn't worth it. They worked in teams of four, the hole man, the rope man, and two tub men. The hole man had the leading role, First, he would steal himself for the ordeal to come. Then, he would carefully make his way down into the depths of the cesspit. Once comfortably settled, he would loosen the sludge and scoop waste into a bucket. Next, the rope man hauls the bucket up and passes it to the tub men, who stand alert and ready. The tub men then carefully bring the buckets to a cart and dump out the thick, foul excrement. Then return for more. As waste was removed, the hole got deeper, and the distance for hauling up of buckets increased. So the rope man had to be at the top of his game, or the hole man would pay a filthy price. It's no surprise that being a night soil man was one of the most highly paid jobs a common man could get in 18th century London. This system existed for nearly 150 years until the reintroduction of John Harrington's flush toilet took England by storm. But its use caused huge problems at first. The problem was, at the same time we had the night soil men performing this great job, that more and more people were moving into the cities. They really couldn't keep up with it. They would actually sometimes even dump the waste into you know, the rainwater drains that they'd already built earlier on. But these weren't equipped you know, to handle the amounts of sewage that were there and the amounts of waste. In London during the 19th century, things got so bad that Parliament actually ceased <laughs> running. They had to shut down the government because the stench was that bad. The members of Parliament grabbed the curtains, <laughs> the ancient curtains had been hanging in there forever, grabbed them off, the, wrapped around their heads and went running from the building. The summer of 1858, when the stench became so bad that Parliament could no longer ignore the problem, would come to be known as the Great Stink of London. Parliament's solution was to create a new job to help keep the sewers clean. These men were called, appropriately, flushermen. As night soil men cleared the streets and the cesspits, the flushermen had the far more dangerous task of flushing blockages from the dark and deadly maze of sewers. Working in the shadow of the flushermen were the toshers. Toshers weren't employed by anyone. They worked for themselves. Toshers would scavenge the sewers, hoping to find items of value. According to some estimates, as many as 100,000 men, women, and children, about 5% of London's population, earned their living in the sludge. But it was dangerous work. 
the air was lethal. The gases from the waste could poison even the hardiest of men. There were no maps of the maze of sewers, and it was easy to get lost forever. Once they realized they had to do more than just have a great toilet, they had to have sewers and drainage that actually took it properly out of the city and away from society. They built these aqueducts that rivaled the Romans. Once this happened, the toilet took its proper place as the throne of civilization. Today, a flush of the toilet sends waste down into a complex series of sewers and far away from your home. So we can flush away as much as we like, and no one has to go down a hole. His body emptied of unnecessary fluids, Joe can now focus on filling it up again at a restaurant. There are epic stories in everything around us and every place we go. This is Joe. He doesn't know these stories and won't get a chance to learn them because today he will die. The story of the modern restaurant, for instance, begins after the French Revolution. With the fall of the ruling class, personal chefs found themselves out of work. They opened eateries where all could be served food prepared by professionals. There are many more items of interest inside the restaurant. But the ones with the most amazing tales to tell are among the smallest. Take salt, for example. It is one of the most common minerals on Earth. So it may be a surprise that until recently, salt was very difficult to come by. Because it was so difficult to take from the Earth and use, salt became exceptionally valuable. You can go from present day life, where you have salt everywhere, to the rest of human history as of 100 years ago, when salt was almost impossible to come by. Because of the scarcity of salt and because of our dependence on it, uh, it's been of strategic value since the dawn of time. Actually, the very first documented war ever fought was over salt in China some several thousand years ago. Salt was such a precious commodity in many places that it was actually exchanged as a form of currency for people. So a good example of that would be the Romans who would often pay their soldiers at least partially in salt, it would get a salt ration, and that's the origin of the word salary, salarium. The Romans understood very early on that if they controlled salt production, they controlled an entire economy. It would be traded ounce for ounce for gold. A reminder of how rare salt used to be is still with us today in a ritual from the time of Christ. Few people now know why we throw salt over our shoulder. In biblical times, nothing came easy. One had to work very hard to afford basic necessities like salt, which was so valuable that spilling it was considered the work of the devil creeping up and pushing you from behind. The remedy then was to throw a pinch of salt over your shoulder, which would blind Satan and drive him back to his fiery pit. To early man, losing even this little bit of salt was a source of great dismay, but this is no longer the case. We manufacture salt now on huge industrial scale. Salt is used as the foundation for many of the chemicals and materials that we use in our modern day lives. From glass to plastics to dyes and textiles and paper. It's used by millions of tons to de-ice roads. Today, the mineral that wars were once fought over is so common we can waste it. For nothing more than a few moments amusement. Of course, what amuses one person does not necessarily amuse another. Salt is not the only item on our table once considered among our most valuable commodities. People would once do anything to give their food a little flavor. Many men have risked and often lost their lives to get their hands on spices. When 
average people just started to get access to pepper and other spices, it was like, you know, it was like winning the lottery back then. People would spend their money on things that made them feel happy. And the only thing that really made you feel happy in those days was eating well. And so eating well meant spicing your food up. By having spice in their life, by putting spice in the food, it elevated their cuisine from really pretty horrible to excellent. It was as important as anything that they ever had back in the day, and that's why spices were worth what they were worth. People were willing to pay almost anything to get spice so they can have something good to eat every day. For most of human history, spices were only available to those who lived near their source. By the late 1400s, brave men traveled great distances and faced extraordinary dangers to bring spices home. One of these voyages resulted in the European discovery of America. When Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue, he was looking for the Spice Islands, and instead he found Cuba and the United States. He thought he was gonna find pepper, Piper nigra, the little black pepper. Instead of finding pepper, he found chilies. And when he tasted it, he said, aha, it's hot. It reminds me of the sensation of pepper. When it has absolutely nothing to do with pepper, he just said, I'm gonna name this pepper. It's a different form of pepper and hope that Queen Isabella didn't notice. Many other dangerous voyages were launched in the quest to bring spices to Europe. But no man was more determined or paid a higher price than Ferdinand Magellan. Magellan's plan was to become the first man to travel around the world. But his motive was not exploration, it was commerce. Magellan wanted nutmeg. With five ships carrying a crew of 234, he left Spain in 1519, and after avoiding an opposing Portuguese fleet, sailed westward to South America. On the coast of Argentina, Magellan put down a mutiny and executed at least one of his ship's captains. In November 1520, Magellan became the first European to cross into the Pacific from the Atlantic. And there he found nothing. No one anticipated that the ocean, which Magellan named Pacific for its calm waters, would be so vast and so empty. The Pacific voyage Magellan thought would take a few days became four months. Food quickly ran out. The crew was forced to eat rat droppings, moldy biscuits, sawdust, and bits of leather from the sails. Their only water was yellow and putrid. Magellan's crew sailed for more than three months without fresh food or water until finally reaching Guam, where the remaining 150 crew members were at last able to eat and drink their fill. They set sail again for the Spice Islands, but first made one terrible mistake. They stopped in the Philippines. Magellan and his crew got involved in a war between rival kings in which Magellan would meet his fate, getting hacked to bits by the opposing army. Of the 234 men that set sail, only 18 made it back to Spain. They were the first men to sail around the world, but at that time, their greatest feat was returning with a boatload of nutmeg. Today, pepper and other spices are so common that no one has to risk their lives or lie to royalty to get them. Now, we barely have time to think about the foods we eat and how they came to have the flavors they do. Money. We rarely ask ourselves why these pieces of paper have value. To answer this, we must first come to understand the many millennia it took humanity to arrive at what we all know as money. Money began when people doing barter trade needed something of value to even out transactions of uneven value. If I had a chicken and I was bartering with somebody with a cow, my chicken wasn't worth as much as his cow. 
So I had to come up with a system of giving him something of value that he would accept. What happened was money began first as shells and then other trinkets of value in order to have it accepted more widely, it began to be minted in metals of value, gold, copper, silver, tin. There were a number of them. For thousands of years, money was valuable. It was backed by precious metals. But in 1971, something happened. Most people don't realize that the simplest things around us have epic stories to tell. Instead, we go about our business happily unaware. And as day becomes night, we hope that this business turns into fun. For many of us, a night of fun begins with a withdrawal of cash from an ATM. Several millennia ago, to make a transaction, one would begin by dragging livestock to the marketplace. The modern process is much simpler. People who use ATMs spend an average of 25% more than people who don't. With cash so readily available, we rarely have occasion to question what this money represents, or if it represents anything at all. For many millennia, money did represent items of value. The U.S. could only print as much money as it had gold. But in 1971, with the cost of the Vietnam War and the weakening of U.S. currency, Richard Nixon removed the dollar from the gold standard. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets. Now, the U.S. can print as much money as it wants, and it does not have to be tied to anything of value. Money is just a marker for transactions. It used to be based on gold, but after 1971, it was allowed to float in the marketplace. It's no longer based on anything but faith and it was international trade on a day-to-day -day basis that set the value of the dollar and does till this day. Every empire since the days of the Romans who were on a fiat currency, which is a currency based just on faith, has sort of backed in to a dilemma where people continue to push the value of the currency until some sort of a bubble-like event happens. Despite this, money is quite good at enabling men to make wagers. And there are few things men enjoy wagering over more than games of skill. One of the most popular for many centuries has been billiards. Billiards began as an outdoor lawn game, like croquet, when it was originally played in Europe in the 15th century. That's why the cloth is green, like grass. Original pool cues were called maces and had large heads reminiscent of golf clubs. But these were hard to use for shots near the rail. So in the late 1600s, players began to turn their sticks around and use the narrow end called a cue. To avoid tearing the table's cloth and other mishaps, only the most skilled players were allowed to use the cue stick. Now, everyone uses it, and mishaps are not uncommon. Joe continues to tempt fate. But he won't be murdered now. Instead, he will smooth things over with our next topic of epic history, beer. From its unlikely beginnings in Sumer, beer has been crucial to the development of civilization. Beer was discovered strictly by accident. What probably happened was that grain or bread that was baked or maybe even fruit sat in a bowl, it got wet, it then maybe sat again for another couple of weeks before people came back to it. Lo and behold, there was a liquid that seemed to have a different taste. What was this liquid? Let me try some.